Uh, ready to do this thing? Yeah, let's go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited today to talk to a comedian friend of mine here, uh, Alex Hooper. How are you? I'm good. Cheers, man. Yeah, cheers to you. Thanks for joining Driving with Dave. I am so excited to be here. I wanted to be on scuba diving with Dave, but unfortunately, the audio was a little more difficult. I like to think I underwater. Know, so. I know we didn't. You're the sharks. I'm, I get nervous, but uh, we'll do okay here. And again, you're, I don't want to out where you live, but this is a beautiful street. I just absolutely love uh, the trees in this neighborhood because I think in in uh, palm trees are not indigenous to LA. I think They're not. Th this is indigenous, right? I. I, I mean, they're definitely indigenous to California, for sure, these trees. They're very remnant, uh, reminiscent of what you get in, like, the redwoods or, yeah. like, the sequoias. It's just massive. Uh, yeah, huge. It's whenever there's a storm on our uh, uh, that comes through L.A., like, whether it's a little bit of rain or wind, our street just becomes brush-covered. Like, you can't even see the pavement. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. It's, but, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting street to live on. I love this area. Um, okay, so there's a lot I want to get into with you. Uh, you've made me cry. Oh no! Yep. What did I do? Well, get into it. I, <laughs> I say, <laughs> damn you! I, I've said this before about it, comedy is about making an audience laugh, right? But it's also about like making them feel something. Yes. And I think you do such a good job of that on stage, but also you've had huge hurdles you've had to overcome uh, in life. Sure. Uh, let's start with America's Got Talent. Let's start okay. there. You were a the roast guy on the show. Yeah, I was I was a heel for sure. Yeah, I was brought in to be kind of a villain on the show. Did the audience, I mean, uh, these, these audiences they're kind of just like binary, like we love you, we hate you, booed. Now, you started off kind of getting booed by you know, kind of like the whole crowd. Yeah. And then kind of became would you say you reversed heel or like they just kind of got what you were doing? Well, they never really got in the, in the first, my first season in 2018, they never really got it. Like they edited it in a way where, where it makes them look like they're cheering for me. They were not at all <laughs> cheering for me. Like they wanted me out of there. They were visceral hatred really? coming, th coming at me. And I've never experienced anything like that in my, in, even then, but up to then or since, I mean, 3000 people, are literally loathing me, just sending vitriol. Because you did some roast jokes me. at Simon, and you did roast jokes at um, who else? Everybody, Heidi like Klum. Yeah, Heidi Klum, Mel B, uh, Howie Mandel, Tyra Banks, and they're all because those are icons to these people. Yeah. They show up and they're like, "How dare? Who are you to talk to them like that?" I'm like, "I'm a poor little no-name comic. These are iconic billionaires." Yeah. Like we should, we should be able to make fun of them, and that's what I was doing. Is I was being the court jester, yeah. going in there, and it's so funny how many people took that seriously and thought that was real. Or I mean, it was real, but they thought that's who I was. So what's the process like? You clearly go through an audition. Now uh, they audition a lot of comedians, and at one point, did you just go straight in as a roast guy, or did you? Do yeah, it? they brought me. They they wanted somebody to roast the judges, so they okay. brought in a few people that were like roast battle veterans to come in and audition and I just thought this is never going to work on this show unless we do it in a very fantastical and extravagant way which that's kind of my way of roasting anyway is over the years I just kind of developed this character that's arrogant and a little infallible and basically just magnificent in every way where you can't hurt me because I know exactly who I am. Yeah you're like in the this fairy role. godmother of roasters. Yeah. Actually. It's kind of, that's the thing is I put a little just like silliness to it and by doing it that way I figured this is the only way it's going to work on a show like America's Got Talent. Otherwise, what am I'm just a white guy just mad at these celebrities for some reason? Yeah. No, I need to be a full on eccentric clown. And that's what works as a heel in wrestling is like knowing you're the bad guy. Yeah. But, but I mean, did you did you like what did you think would come out of it? Was it what you expected or was it kind of like, all right, well that's done? I mean, I, I didn't know what would come out of it. I thought I had, like, ruined my career that I already was, like, struggling to have. I, I thought it was going to be awful because in the moment it was. And, I, you know, anyone that was in that room will tell you I bombed. And then it hits the Internet 
and they edited it in a very flattering way that made me look like I knew exactly what I was doing, which in some ways I did, in other ways I didn't. Yeah. You know, but my main thing was just like, if I don't break character, I can say, yeah, it was all on purpose, everybody. As long as I don't break character. Oh, yeah. It's not like you're doing a bit on dating that goes bad and you go into the crowd and, you know, they, like, we've, we, I'm sure we both got, have plenty of experience of truly bombing where you're just like, <laughs> you know, uh, for me, a real bomb is like when you're trying your best and they just don't like you and then the next guy does well. Like, that's, that's when it's a real bomb. Yes. And the next, when every other comic <laughs> did well and you're like, and you're like, oh, I'm the asshole of the show. Yeah, I have certainly bombed in many situations, and that was scary because I was like, this is the biggest opportunity I've ever had. This is going to be seen by millions of people. This is, like, as big as it gets as far as being a comedian on TV. So it was, you know, a horrifying moment until it aired and it hit the hit the internet and all the people that wouldn't watch America's Got Talent otherwise saw it and were like, whoa, oh, who yeah. is this? What did he just do? Like, this is great. Like, and it, that's when I was like, oh, it's going to be okay. People respect this, what I did. Yeah, that's a great example of play, knowing your audience. Like, you're actually, like, they knew you're playing to the internet, not the room. Like, they know they can do whatever they want with the audio. You hit all your jokes, which is all that matters, you know? It's almost like, um, I, I remember um, there was a comic who bombed so bad, and it turned out to be, like, an iconic special. Uh, but in the moment, they thought it was the end, because they just, it was... The, the, the room isn't always the accurate representation of what is and what isn't funny. And, you know, they probably were used to getting, I don't know, a lot of sugar-coated comedy, some good music, and then all of a sudden you come in and they're like, are we supposed to not like you? <laughs> like, right. right. Well, no one had ever done anything like that before where they really were just that, just kind of indifferent to what the judges thought of them. Everyone's fighting for their approval. And I went out there and look, I had my, I had my hope that they, they were like, maybe they'll get it. Maybe they'll understand. Yeah. And like, no, that was just so, so, so far from what happened. Well, watching it on my end, I kind of got that. I kind of got that vibe that, that you were able to flip them. Um, so, but uh, hey, if you, if you flip the internet, I guess that's all that matters. Right. And that's why I went back and was able to go back in 2020, two years later and do it all over again and actually make it all the way to the live shows because this time they understood what I was doing and they celebrated it. So many people on like, will say like, this is not the right audience for this, for this man. And I'm like, that's the point. That's <laughs> why it's so funny yeah. because they don't know that I'm going to do that. Like I'm catching them completely off guard. That's why it's always funny. I get, you know, when I get any hate online, like, uh, you know, just about every other day, I always say this, like the, the, the more successful I've been online, the more I've been called a failed comedian. Yes. And always. It, that's it. It's like, well, you wouldn't have known I existed otherwise. And that's part of doing America's got talent or putting yourself out there is to acquire whatever audience you can because you don't know what's going to take off and this might just be a chapter in your story and and, and in some cases like Preacher Lawson and others it becomes like a very big a draw for them yeah. it's just like you just don't know but that's part of opportunity is like it's really we just got to keep opening the doors you have to do it and also at the same time negative comments are good that means it's reaching people that are not your fan base mm -hmm. it's getting out in the ether if you look at a if you post a YouTube video and all you have is 30 very positive comments, this is great, I love this. It has not really hit that yet. Oh, Those uh, yeah. are your people that are chiming in, right? But if suddenly somebody goes, this is fucking terrible. Why would anybody watch this? This is the least funny thing I've ever seen. You're like, now it's hitting. Oh, the algorithm. Now it's hitting. <laughs> Argue in the comments, baby. Oh, yeah. I'll know. Like, oh, I angered the Christians. It looks like we're going places. <laughs> oh, the uh, Republicans don't like me. Oh, it's it's even fun when I piss off the left. You know, when, when you can kind of piss off all sides. Oh, like, that's the best. Um, but, uh, you know. Okay, so the last, I think the last time I saw you was, I think you, I think we connected at uh, the Improv Lab. I think you were about to do a spot there. And I think we were actually planning our weddings relatively around the same time. Yeah. Um, is that you got married in what time, when? October of 2022. Okay, I got married in April of 22. Okay, so, so you, yeah, pretty so close. yeah, that makes sense that you were probably like around six months ahead of me. And, but and that, you did a destination wedding too, right? Yes. Where were you? Uh, in Tulum. Okay, yeah, we were in Puerto Vallarta. Okay, so that makes, okay, it all lines up. I was like, yes. I, I knew we connected in one way or another. Now, but... 
I want to get into the big C word. Uh oh, what, uh, compatibility? Because yeah. my wife and I don't uh, like each other at all. No, <laughs> is, the other is one. Is this something that you're comfortable talking about? Yeah, because of course. Because yeah. when we talked, you had not yet been diagnosed with cancer, correct? Correct. And uh, then I think it was very shortly after. Yeah, I mean, so I got married in April of 2022 and didn't know it then, but already the cancer was inside of me. I started getting tested in very early June, and in three months of all the testing to figure out what it was, they basically knew it was cancer, but didn't know what kind, so I had to go through every test under the sun to figure out what it was, and then eventually, in August, I was actually, at the end of August, I was diagnosed. See, we're about the same age, right? 38, late yep, 30s? 38. Yeah. When's your birthday? Uh, July 17th. All right, I'm May 1st. I've, I'm, an el- I'm an elder. Yeah, of course. Uh, please, please give me your wisdom, sir. <laughs> but we have a lot of like, you know, we're very, as far as like the comedy world goes, we're like really close in age and, and some some of these shared experiences, you know, getting yeah. married and stuff. Um, I, I just melted when I saw your, your sort of stories that you were sharing. I can imagine you don't want to be known as a guy who's just, you know, had to battle cancer, but it's a part of your battle. How did you, how did you know something was wrong? Like what, 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 what happened? So I was, I mean, it was kind of like my neck started like kind of just like, like ballooning out and I could feel these things inside. And I first, I thought it was like, I've, I've had bad eczema my entire life. So I've gotten staph infections many, many times over. And I was like, okay, I'm just having a bad staph infection. And that's why my lymph nodes are swollen because it's a sign of infection, but then they weren't going down. And I mean, truth be told, I was at a music festival, uh, Lightning in a Bottle, and I was with a bunch of my friends and my wife, and this was in like late May. I'm tripping on acid, and all of a sudden, like, I can't stop touching my neck, and I was like, something is wrong with me. And it's one of those things where when you're on psychedelics, you can't lie to yourself. Whoa. You can't go, nah, this is probably nothing. I'm like, no, something is going on. It was like a heightened awareness? For sure. Whoa. And I knew I had to, like, check myself as soon as I got back, and I told my wife that when I came down from the trip I was like I think something's really wrong here and I need to go to a doctor and that's really what started me on that journey and I was ready to share it all like right away and I kind of went through two modes I was like okay do I keep this to myself and just hope nobody notices and maybe I'll just fight my way through it and I don't have to make this a part of me at all but then I'm a very open energy and the personable gregarious side of me was like, no, this is, I'm going to tell people, like, I'm just going to let people know right away. So I don't have to answer questions because my biggest fear was that I would start to look sickly and then people be like, are you okay, man? I'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. It's just, uh, you know, I had some bad shrimp. Like I didn't want to have to go down that road. Which is what some people like Norm MacDonald and some other people went through where like they right. kept it very private, which again, it, like you said, it's a route to take, but I think, I mean, what did it feel like when you decided, I'm going to talk about this, uh, as far as the support you received and all of that? Like, what was that moment like? So, I made a YouTube video um, when I actually got diagnosed and found out it was stage 3 Hodgkin's lymphoma. I literally went home and just put on my camera and just said, well, everyone, I have cancer, and then just talked for, like, 10 minutes. And I posted it, and... I immediately shut my computer and I was like, I've made a huge mistake. And my wife goes, Alex, you haven't, I would have not, I wouldn't have let you do that if I thought it was a bad idea. So I, she's like, just put your phone away for three hours and, uh, don't do any, just don't look at it. And when I finally did open my computer back up, it was nothing, like hundreds of messages, texts, DMs, comments. I mean, all, what, what, like, were you, what were you worried about? That there'd be haters? Or it that... was, no, it's this, it's, it's this a, um, a vulnerability fatigue, like this, like, or like this kind of just weird feeling of what have I just, I've just opened myself up to a world of questions and just, um, different I, I didn't know what to expect I had never been like like so vulnerable with something that it was brand new to me and I didn't know what I was about to go through but I knew that I had to be open about it and just kind of just speak it out and it would make myself feel better you also you, you also brought so much just I don't I, I don't know how to describe it you brought you brought so much passion to like not 
not letting it define you in those moments. And I don't know how else to put it other than you just, you were, you, you talked about it almost through positivity, but also like clinically, like this is what I have. I'm not letting it affect me, my joy and all these other things that you said. And that's just, that's brave as fuck because it's scary. Yeah. Thanks. Es- especially when you've got, you know, your wife and you got other people that like care about you now, you know, when you're a single comic, you know, things it's like, yeah, I don't know when, when like there's other people and family that rely on you and it's like, you don't want to suck their mood down too. Yeah. I mean, well, it's just, it's this weird thing where I, I just didn't know how else to go about it. And, and I'm known for my silliness and my positivity. And I'm like, I call myself unapologetically positive. Like I will always find the bright side of things. And I've been like that for years. And it's been a daily practice of don't be stressed. Don't be depressed. Don't be angry. There's always something good that you can find. And even in the cancer, I was like, okay, well, this will. This isn't going to kill me. Medicine is good. I know I can beat it. This will only strengthen my story going forward. And if I can show people, then maybe like what this is in a very truthful but comedic light. Hopefully, it will alleviate some of their own fears. And when they go through it, or a family member goes through it, because <laughs> you will. It's <laughs> one of those moments where you can go. Wait a minute. This doesn't have to be some sort of dismal hole of despair that we all fall into. Like, I went into every single chemo session, like, with a smile on my face, going, give me the medicine. I'm ready for it. Like, let me, like, just be here for it. I didn't go in there like, God, not this again. Because I knew mentality was going to be everything to get me through this experience, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's so true. You know, you, there's so much self-sabotage that happens when we feel glum and feel bad for ourselves. It's I don't know wh- why the body does that, but, you know, you, it need, knows. you need to know that you need to have as high a vibrancy as possible. It was, yeah, and it was also my family, my wife, my friends. They If they saw me sliding down the wrong way, going into a downward spiral, it w- they would have been terrified even more so, and they already were. But because I was kind of more jo- not jovial, but like making jokes and just kind of lighthearted, not I-, I treated it with you know sincerity, and it was a serious situation. But I also added levity. Right, that's all you can do. It's like you can you can check off all the boxes of the things you need to do, chemo, whatever, this, that. But it, but then like you got to fill the gaps in with your your mood and persona. But did you? I mean, did you contemplate death, or did they tell you right away like you're going to be okay? Or was that? I mean, you said it was stage three, right? Yeah, I um. Pretty you know, serious. there were a couple. Yeah, there were a couple times when I definitely was absolutely miserable, and I did. I, it wasn't even so much contemplating death as it was almost like. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? Like, that'd be the easy way out. Like, I can be a, what could he have been instead, you know? Like, you know, I was, I thought about people all the way they think of me so fondly. And, um... But everyone has that thought where they're like, who's going to show up? Who would show up to my funeral? Like, we always have that morose thought of, like, who's who's in my life? Who cares about me? So, uh, and again, like you said, when you, when you treat it, if you treat your cancer with a certain in a certain way your friends and family are going to come at you in that way and no one wants to be thought of as like a baby or like no one wants to be you know like babied and pity i guess pitied is the right word like you don't want to be pitied no but at the same time i mean it must have really did open up any connections with family that maybe were taken for granted it just made it 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 definitely made everything just more real and more I'm more appreciative more grateful and I understood like I like you know you said like who would show up to my funeral getting something like stage three cancer is kind of like dying while you're alive I kind of got to pull like the Huck Finn move of like watching my own funeral because people were just commenting so many nice things and just sending me these beautiful messages and gifts and like you know there was a time when it got really bad like last November like a year ago today I was in a hospital for 33 days straight because my chemo port they did a surgery to put a port under my skin got infected internally and I went septic 
Oh my god! So I had a stroke. I had a heart vegetation, and when I went in the hospital, they didn't know what my out what the outcome was going to be. And at that point, what, what were you were you like progressing in the right direction before that? Yeah, everything was going great. Everything like I was go I was flying through chemo treatments. I think that's the moment. Not, not to make this about me. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. But I think that's the moment where I cried, <laughs> where I'm watching this going. I thought we were good. <laughs> And then you're like, because like, you can only imagine for every person that comments, there's probably a hundred or a thousand that are still watching and I'm sharing it with my wife and I'm going, here's, you know, it, it is, it, there's so many battles amongst humanity and so many warring us versus them, this versus that. But when it comes down to it, there's very few times where we all rally and that's like basic humanity wanting a friend to survive. Yeah. Well, I think I... I think I instilled, me getting it, instilled a fear in a lot of people because all of a sudden, like, I'm a young, healthy person, like, living a very fun lifestyle, but also just, like, you know, a, someone that does lead with, you know, a positive outlook, and suddenly I get cancer and I almost die, and so I think it kind of put people like, oh, shit, well, what do I do in my life that could do this? Yeah. So many people are like, how'd you get it, man? Because they want to know, like, what do I need to avoid? Avoid and like, what do you like? Oh, I drank a gallon of paint every night and stuck my head in the microwave for, for an hour. Should I not have done that? Like, it's cancer. It just I mean, comes. You were pretty healthy. You were slacklining and playing tennis. Yeah. yeah, like oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a fairly. I like I was partying, but I'm still a healthy person. Even in my party days, like I was like exercising a lot, eating well. So. It's just one of those things that kind of came at you out of nowhere, and you deal with it as it comes, but. Yeah. It's so just... take me back to last November. So did was it like at a, a normal checkup that you found out how sick you were or did it was it like one day it, it just turned? No. So so okay, so I have a show. It's a Tuesday night. I have a show at the Irvine Improv and I do the show. I'm not feeling great. You got a good I, cancer bit at this point? Oh my god, I'm about to put out a whole like, cancer special I was basically. Say, you must yeah. be in that nice cancer audience. Oh, gotta... baby, yeah. This is uh, for, for sure. I got I got an LA Times article out of it. I've gotten on a bunch of cancer podcasts that I never wanted to be on or ever heard of. Yeah. All these things. <laughs> like every every cancer podcast I go on, they're like, "Thanks for being here." I was like, "I wish I never fucked heard of this well, well i waited till six minutes in before i brought it up <laughs> actually it's probably three minutes in <laughs> that's good enough you know get through the get to the hard stuff immediately i'm all about that okay so you're on your way to irvine improv yeah so i do the show i'm not feeling great and on the way home i'm just like cold and i get home and i can't stop shivering and my wife's like are you okay how long have you been like this i was like i don't know an hour she's like just go to bed it's a, and i woke up the next day feeling really shitty was supposed to do a show in santa barbara had to cancel it and I've never canceled a show in my entire life. In, in, in 13 years of comedy, I'd never canceled a show. So I canceled it. And I canceled everything I had that week. And on Monday, I had a checkup at my oncologist. And when I went there, I was super out of it. And apparently, like my wife tells me, for the past couple days, I had barely been eating. I was very lethargic. Like basically not being Alex Hooper that I normally am. Mm -hmm. And... Apparently, I was, so they were like, okay, we're going to put fluids in him. Then he needs to go get a PET scan because that was already scheduled. When I got back from my PET scan, I got went home and took a nap. And when I woke up, I, this was all pieced together by stories, by the way, but from my wife and my friends. You mean you don't remember? Oh, no. Like I was delirious for two days. Okay. Completely out of it. Um, I woke up from my nap. It's 8 p.m., my wife's on in our living room watching TV. I walk into our kitchen and just start peeing all over the kitchen. Oh my my God. wife turns around and like, Alex, what are you doing? Don't do that there. And I was like, oh, sorry. Walk into her office and just pee all over the wall and the carpet. And at that point, she realized something is very wrong. I take off all my clothes and she just goes sit in the bathroom, just sit in the toilet. She calls two of our closest friends over because she doesn't know what to do. They rush over. I am, my friend is like, you got to sit down. And I go, how do I do that? And he goes, what do you mean? Just put your butt on the chair behind you. And he goes, and I'm like, how, I don't know how to do that. Is this the stroke? Is this yeah. the stroke? Yeah. So this so, is, this is your whole brain not, not understanding. That's so, what's so crazy about strokes is sometimes you look coherent, but the wires are. Well, that's the thing. So this was not, this was not like a g -g 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 stroke. This was multiple embolism. So it was like a long term oh, stroke happening. Right. And then when I went to the hospital, they realized 
he's septic. Like, and I didn't even know how bad sepsis was. I don't really know much about that. Dude, yeah. it, so sepsis is, it's, a, it's your body is, it's, an, it's a very intense reaction to an infection. So apparently it, it just starts throwing everything it can at you and your organs start shutting down. And sepsis is so serious that it kills one out of five people who get it today. Wow. Like if you go septic, you only have an, you have an 80% chance of making so it out. Even, it, even when you get to the hospital, it's at that point, it's already a battle. It's already a battle. And I'd been septic for apparently a couple days. And they told me, and they, they told my wife in the hospital, like, brace yourself. We don't know how this is going to go. He has a shower of clots in his brain. Oh. And so they don't know. Not only do they not know if I'm going to live, they don't know what state I'm going to be in. Which imagine your wife two, a few months mm. into your marriage, right? And you guys have been together a long time as well. Yeah. So all of a sudden you get married and suddenly you don't know what state your husband how's, is going to be in. Scary. Oh my God. She's terrified. You know, my, um, my good friend died of a stroke and I remember the moments where we were asking all the questions you ask, like, all right, well, if he's no longer able to walk, that's okay. We'll get him a ramp. You start to like negotiate all these things. And then it's just never enough because it can go in so many directions. So I totally understand this helplessness that comes from just uh, being told no by your body and yeah. not being able to, you know, like when you're on stage, dig yourself out of a mess. You can bomb all you want on stage and still dig yourself out or whatever. But this is like, I, um, I totally relate to the helplessness. Yeah. And, you... but, and the thing is, it wasn't helplessness from my part because I didn't even know what was happening. I was so out of it, delusional that like, it wasn't until I'd been in the hospital like four or five days when I was just like, when I started, like when I started actually understanding mm -hmm. what was going on and I was so out of it in the hospital that I couldn't read, I couldn't write. All I could do was just lay there. I was completely immobile for two and a half weeks. What are they doing to repair the brain? Are they draining you? S like they're doing. Doing, I mean, I had to do a lot of uh, MRIs, a ton of antibiotics, like, you know, all these, my, my body swelled up with edema because my my tissues wouldn't release water. So I gained 30 pounds while I, in the hospital, like, just like, That's so crazy. I couldn't move. I was in just so much pain. Uh, it was, it was so gnarly in, um, in every possible way, just a painful, a excruciating time of my life. Life where, you know, when I started to come to, that's when you start having the depression. That's when the suicidal thoughts come in of just like, can you just, can I just pay the check here, please? Like, I'm done <laughs> with this shit. Just be good. Check, please. We're, we're good. No tips. Yeah. I don't need dessert. Like, this is good. Like, honestly, I just like, I was going through the ringer and like my wife was going through it right there with me. Oh, you know, I didn't know when I went into the hospital, I was going to be there for over a month. That's fucking insane. Now, were you feeling, was there this feeling like I've kind of presented myself as the guy who's going to laugh this off and now I can't? Like, was there like a, a did you admit defeat? Like, what was, what was that feeling like? Uh, like know, that long in the hospital? Or was it just like a slow water torture? Every once in a while... Every once, because every day was a different form of like pain, right? It was like either I, this procedure has, needs to get done. Um, I became a hard stick because my body swelled up so much. So where I used to just, they used to just stick a needle right in. Like doctors would look at my veins and go, Ooh, look at that baby. Yeah. Oh, stuff, like yeah. a real addict. And then the, then they were like, Ooh, I don't even see anything. And they would just start like digging around in there. Uh -huh. And that's how every day would start 6am. Somebody would come to do blood work for me every single day. They'd wake me up. I had barely slept and they're doing blood work. I'm on a constant stream of Dilaudid, a very strong painkiller, but I couldn't even enjoy Enjoy the painkiller because all it was doing was actually destroying pain. <laughs> like, yeah. It wasn't even like a good high from it. It was just like, <laughs> God damn it, dude. You didn't even get the good high. I, it, was, it, was, it was supposed to be somewhat enjoyable in here. I mean, this sounds like hell. What, at what point did you feel like you turned the corner? So two and a half weeks in, I got to start doing physical and occupational therapy for three hours a day. And the very first time they tried to do it, I literally wasn't strong enough to get out of bed. The second time I tried to do it, all I could do was stand up. They were like, can you take a step? No, I cannot. Mm -hmm. By the fourth time I was walking like eight steps, 
10 steps. And then I really started to turn my brain on going like, like people would like be like, and nurse would be like, are you normally ambulatory? I'm like, I can slack line for three fucking hours without falling off. Yes, I'm fucking ambulatory. And then your brain starts to kick into this mode of, I do not accept this current state. This is not who I am. I will come out of this stronger. I will come out of this better. I will come out of this a more well-rounded human being that has walked through fire and not gotten burnt. And I kept telling myself that every fucking day. And then eventually you're making more and more progress and things are getting a little easier. But even still, like when I got out of the hospital, I had to do a knee surgery that I was supposed to get out. I had to do a knee surgery because my right knee would not drain because of an old injury. So then I had to get knee surgery in the hospital, kept me in there another five days. And when I got out, I was on a walker attached to a fanny pack that had intravenous IV uh, antibiotics feeding me 24 hours a day. So I still was like, oh, I'm still a cripple right now. Like this is still nowhere near where I need to be. But I just told myself, whatever they tell you to do, do even more of it. And just like whatever physical therapy, I'll do double. I'll do this. Like I will exhaust myself to get myself better. And that's why like a year later, I mean, I'm not even a year out of the hospital and I'm, I'm my, my normal slack lining sessions are back up to an hour without falling off. I'm playing tennis You're for an hour and a half. You're on the slack line for an hour? Yeah. Yeah. That's my, <laughs> that's like my, that's my zone out place, man. That is how I like, if I feel myself getting stressed at all, I'm like, just go slack line, man. So and, for those that don't know, it's, it's a, it's like a, what, a three inch wide? One inch. One, it's only one. <laughs> it's a one inch wide uh, line that is connected to whatever tree or yeah. you know, post or whatever and it's extremely I've, I've never stood on one but i imagine for a billion dollars i couldn't last five seconds at now, first you couldn't that's true it for it, it, like right away you couldn't it's you mentally and physically like build up this tolerance and this understanding of it do you think that helps you recover faster because you were able to like you had that strong brain connection to your body and your feet a hundred percent and i knew it would be such an important part of my recovery getting back on my slack line because the amount of strength that it takes and also it's also just the physical confidence in my body when i got back on my slack line for the first time i just started crying mm. i got up there and fell off quickly and then i got up there and sunk into it and there's this moment where i've been slacklining for like six years or something like that now when i get up there i'm just comfortable and i'm relaxed and when you get to that place i suddenly sunk back in and realized like I really am going to be okay here. Like, and that was, and I got out of the hospital at the end of December and that was in March that I started slacklining. I mean, how wild to think that, that you're, you, at, at the time, six years ago, you're learning a skill that is going to then be one that, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe at some point you take it for granted and then all of a sudden you can't stand again and you're like, well, fuck this. I'm going back onto that slack line. Dude, when I was doing physical therapy in the hospital, they like the, um, one of the physical therapists was like, like found out that I slack lined and set up, he set up a series of cushions for me to like walk across. And he's like, this is not going to be the same, but it will give you a little feeling of just like imbalance. And I think walking across this is going to be really Really good for you and um, so yeah it's just one of those things where it used to just be this silly like you know hobby that I had that made me feel good about myself and really centered me but I never thought it was gonna be some sort of recovery tool you don't think about that shit you when you're know. just like uh, at a music festival just like oh well I'm gonna cross a silly one bouncy tightrope <laughs> <laughs> and next thing you know you're just well that's what's interesting about the slack line is that I, I can only imagine you must have you, you must need incredible focus to like be in the moment there's no looking down checking your dms when you're hanging out I mean maybe if you get good at it but it seems like it's just such a a wild way to be present. That's it taught me. It taught me how to focus. It literally oh pug, oh pug. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's what's so great about doing a podcast in a car. Suddenly you just see an old pug and you're like, yay! <laughs> um, yeah, it, it taught me how to focus and to just really be attuned with what was going on inside my body. And I think that's why when something when, when those lymph nodes were swelling, I knew something was wrong. I could feel it. And I was like, something is not right, you know, 
on Mulberry Street. Like, I gotta change, I gotta figure this out. I mean, now, do you have these, like, jeez, oh, I'd have PTSD like that, like, tomorrow it's gonna come back. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm not trying to stress No, you no, out. no. I'm, sure. I'm gonna come off looking like the biggest asshole because I'm, you're, you're the one who suffered all this and I'm stressed out over here, <laughs> you know, like, making it about me. <laughs> and no, but it does happen. Like, I would, like, a few months after I got out of the hospital, like, I felt a little thing in my neck and I was like, oh, fuck, it's back. It's definitely back. It's back. Of course it's back. Why wouldn't it be back? Like, uh, why didn't, why did I think I was done with this? But I had to quickly, like, you know, dispose of those thoughts. You have to get, you can't stay in that place. And I think the reason why, like, people now will come up to me like, how are you feeling? Are you good? And I'm like, if you see me out in the world, I'm good. Yeah. I'm great. If you don't see me for a long time, start to worry about it. <laughs> but it really, it really is this whole thing of, like, do not, like, I'm still processing so much of what happened, Mm -hmm. but I can't stay in that place. And every once in a while, like, uh, and like my doctor recently asked me a question. He's like, are you still having night sweats? And I was like, oh, I forgot about the night sweats. No, no, no. Don't make me think about that. That was terrible. I would wake up in just a puddle of myself. Like that was the worst. Like I had to wash the sheets every single day when I was going on. Like, no, I'm not still having night sweats. But then I remembered like, no, think about how far away from that, that that wasn't even a thought in my brain until you brought it back up. Yeah. So it's... it's so I'm just bringing back up all of them. <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's part of it, you know? Well, I, it's But that's what mentality, right? I'm not triggered by any of this. I, I'm open to talking about it because I think people need to know what happens in these experiences and it's just important that, you know, we're not kept, in our, kept out of the loop. And yeah. so, yeah, it has. To, it became a part of my comedy. I knew it would, you know. But yeah, life gives you these things that you then have the special gift to talk about. Now, you and I are both ten plus years in. We're at that stage where some people are on SNL, some people are national touring headliners with fifty thousand dollar Patreons. Everyone's kind of finding their success in different ways. I saw you posted something maybe a few months back about maybe, maybe I don't want to put words in your mouth, maybe bitterness or disappointment at where you were av- after having recovered from cancer. Um, I, I related to it so well because we, we don't always get the thing we thought we wanted and sometimes it's different paths to get there. But uh, how do you feel, like, like, what, like how do you cope with those feelings of like what is success going to look like for me? It's, um, you have to be happy with where you are. First of all, you have to be, I have to look at my life and be grateful. And especially when I, if I start to get bitter now, I can really go, Hey man, remember a year ago Mm. you were eating powdered mashed potatoes, watching the world cup, hoping that you weren't going to have to go through another shitty MRI today. Like, Hey, this is a pretty good day right now. And it's also a matter of, yes, could things be better in my career? Always. Of course they could. But am I doing it my own way that makes me feel authentic and gives me this feeling of like illuminated energy where I'm kind of pro- projecting this hopefully positivity, positive outlook on other people? Okay, yes, I'm doing all that. So everything else will come. And one thing I've really had to learn from this experience is like patience. Because when you beat cancer, you go, okay, did everyone see that? Can you just give me the things I've been, can, you, can I get book this next audition, please? Can my voiceover career finally take off instead of just countless, countless auditions and tapes and everything else? Can I just start having some consistency? And then you go, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> Not yet. And no. that's, that's a surrender that's very tough to cope with because I feel like the greatest sales pitch I have to make is to myself to be like, come on, Dave, you're doing it. You're going to be all right. And I would tell my wife this, and I think she believed me as best as she could. I mean, she stuck around with me, but there was there's just these moments where it's like doubt creeps in, but also you're a fantastic comic. It's not about being good at your job. It's about, all right, how do I, how do I make it so I can get 85 tickets sold in every market because it's like when you're you know when you're talking about like the circus of being a comic it doesn't have to be needing to sell out an arena it's just like all right how do i get 40 tickets sold that buys this and then the merch will pay for the gas and all these little things yeah and i don't think we're i don't think as uh, comics we're asking for too much it's just it's just at that stage where all right 
uh, the act is coming together. How do we get the, the nation to check out what we're doing? And when it does happen, it is kind of overnight. Yeah, but it, it doesn't <laughs> it feel feels that way. right. It's like it's like oh, finally after 15 years, you finally understand what I've been doing. Yeah, I tell myself this: I know what I do in the room. When I get on stage, I know what happens. I can't lie to myself about it. I listen to myself. I watch myself. I don't go, well, yeah, that was a good set when it wasn't a good set. Mm-hmm. Like I know what happens, and so how do I get? the internet basically to catch up with me what I'm doing in the room because that's how you really sell tickets. And when I go to a city and 14 tickets are sold and I'm like, fuck, why did I do this to myself again? And you're sitting in that hotel room by yourself, Mm -hmm. just questioning every decision you've ever made. You have to go, wait, didn't I choose to do this? Didn't I, I chose to come here and maybe I didn't have the show that I wanted or the crowd that I wanted, but I'm doing this thing that is way better than any, most other things that I could be doing. Yeah. And so it will come. It's just a matter of like, it's never going to be as fast as you want it to. And hopefully when it gets, when it really gets there, when I am like selling out full weekends in advance, when I go into a weekend going, no, there are no tickets left. Yeah. You get to make that poster that says sold out. Sold out (laughs) everywhere you go. We added a show that sold out too. Sunday, 4 PM show. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. You know, the comics doing well when there's a, fourth show on a Friday and a 4 p.m. on a Saturday. <laughs> You're like, damn. People are cutting work just to go. It's one of those things where I hope then I'm not like, what else is out there? What am I not doing now? Because there is that level of no matter where you get to, you're going to want something more. Mm. But that's a, that's also a matter of finding the joy of where you are right now and knowing like, oh, cool. Well, you know, I have, you know, sets at multiple comedy clubs this week and I'm about to film a special. I got some road work coming up. I have a couple auditions that I need to do. Like, okay, these are all possibilities and opportunities that I'm thankful to have because like I said, like a year ago, I had nothing. It yeah. was literally a fight to survive. I think it's it's totally fair to, to to have to like check yourself because we do have those moments where I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I get to I get to make content at home in my pajamas. I got I get to see my family. I get to do all these things that a few years ago I wasn't doing. And then you go, all right, pipe down. Like there, the people there's people would fight to have the life I have. And every almost every comic you hear from who's quote unquote made it, they look back at the times that like we're in where we've kind of like outgrown the real the real struggle of the first five years like that real kind of like we kind of like starting to know who we are and then it's just like if we didn't if we didn't have that desire to push to the next level we would never push out of the cocoon we just have to remember the cocoon ain't too bad while we're in here yeah and i think i think that's all very important and you know my first i'd say my first seven or eight years i was just having the time of my life because i wasn't thinking about the how i wasn't i was thinking about how to make this a career but it wasn't a career yet because i still had a regular job Mm -hmm. so i was like this is just the best i'm just like throwing parties and going and just telling jokes and getting on stage and I have all these friends like and then when it became a real career and this is the way I make all my money you have to remember how fun it is too yeah. because it beca- the struggle becomes vivid and all of a sudden you're like whoa how am I going to pay my rent this month I don't have enough gigs uh oh what do I do I still need this to be fun all the time yeah and I think that's important to remember is like don't lose the spirit of why you got into it and so much of what like you know I I think it's important to find what your purpose is and I've realized over the years my purpose is to spread love and give people an escape from whatever it is that they're going through however I'm able to do that and you know it's I like involving Invoking emotion from people, whether that's laughter, whether that's pride, you know, whether it's comfort, whatever it is. And which, by the way, it, that's so much harder to get the attention of the internet than someone who's who does mainly like one-liners, right? You know? Like a good one-liner that's shareable on TikTok. But what you kind of do, which is kind of find out what that audience wants in the moment and what that specific audience is going to be, that's a memorable set that people take home and, and really feel like they were part of something unique and special. And yeah. so I feel like you're just right there. 
Now tell me before I drop you off about the special and like what's the like how did you prepare for it and what are you looking to get out of it? Where are you gonna put it? Yeah, I mean so we're filming it January twelfth in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Filming it in Connecticut because my friend and uh, producer director lives out there and we can get a team much cheaper than we could get out here. And I also didn't want to film it in California. I wanted to it to be on the East Coast. Oh, the winter, New England in winter. People oh baby, be, yeah. yeah. They'll be jazz and to laugh. That's that's exactly what I want. I want oh, yeah. that hardcore northeast energy yeah and um and i don't know where you know we're going to try to sell it we have a sales agent that we're going to try to sell it we have some really cool ideas of how to make it a little different but the main thing is like is for me is i've been touring this hour so much over the past five six months since i've been healthy enough to tour again and i've been really refining it into what i want it to be to put out what i'm calling like the first of the cancer um, you know post-cancer material like because i thought i kind of thought to myself like all right i'll just put this one out and be done with cancer stuff like i don't want to talk about this forever and a you know, a really good friend of mine who's a big headliner was like, Alex, you're joking. Like, you're going to talk about this for the rest of your life. This is, everyone's going to bring it up all the time. Like, this is never going to stop. Guilty. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And I was like, oh, you're right. He's like, so just put this one out and get, you know, get the first one out of you, but don't think that you can just stop writing or talking about it. Yeah, I mean, not to project, but it means a lot. It means a lot to people to hear your, your story. Yeah, and that's what I've learned on the road is I've heard, People have come up and just thanked me for talking about such a difficult topic um, and just giving them something different. And that's kind of that's kind of what I always want to do is just I want to show you something that maybe you haven't seen before in the comedy world. Isn't that what you know? I don't want I don't want you to go, yeah, that was great, and immediately forget about it. I want you to go, I don't know what I think about that. That's great. And then walk out of the room and think about it for a while longer. You know? That's that's so right up your alley and um look at that we made it all, all the way back boom i um i'm really happy uh you could join me today and share your message because Dude, it, it, great. it means a lot man it's um it's going to be a lot of fuel for a lot of people you know to continue to to you know before you were positive and inspirational but now you've like you said you've walked through this hell and that's something you can't fake <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if i could take it all back i wouldn't do any of it all over again but you <laughs> yeah. know the fact is we can only play the cards that were dealt and it's up to you to do what you can with it to try to use it as fuel to move forward so i said in the beginning i will use cancer to my advantage and i meant that and i will so. All right, so how can people support you? Um, Bridgeport, Connecticut, obviously. Yeah, go to hoopercomedy.com. That's the easiest way to see my tour dates and, you know, read my blog and, you know, watch my clips, buy my book, whatever, like, uh, things like that. I have a self-help book called Roast Yourself to Happiness that's available on Amazon. Um, social media, at Hooper Hair Puff. That's the easiest way. But the, the email list is honestly the best way to do it because the email list does not hide from an algorithm. So that true. that's direct source material. If I'm coming and I don't spam, it's just, hey, I'm coming to this city yeah. or, hey, I put out this thing. There's nothing Here like doing is. a show in Seattle and then a week later, oh, I wish I knew you were in Seattle. Oh, every time. There? Every fucking time. All right. So the newsletter, go support them. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Just